Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is LaCroix Meadows. I serve as a member of CMC's Board of Trustees. I also serve as the Director of OSU Extension in Franklin County. It's such a pleasure to see everyone here today. Today, we are very excited to learn more about the booming business of esports and digital gaming. If you've ever wondered where your kids, your neighbor's kids, and your underage 30 relatives have been, or my over 40 husband has been, <laughs> esports are popular and for better or for worse, big, big business. And beyond games, the technology can be used in learning, medical settings, and other beneficial applications. So we look forward to hearing more from our experts that are here. So please join me in welcoming the CEO of Multivarious, Chris Volpe. Thank you. <laughs> Associate Professor of Practice with the Department of Engineering at Ohio State University, Dr. Deborah Grisbowski. <laughs> the Director of Game Arena Esports Facility, Justin Kogi. And our wonderful host this afternoon is a journalist from the Columbus Dispatch, Tim Farron. <laughs> Tim, the stage is yours. Thank you. So there's been a lot of excitement around video gaming and esports uh, in Columbus this year, uh, and it's and a great deal of it is due to these three people. Uh, we had a, vid, a, a virtual reality demonstration right here today as well. Video gaming is huge, very big, but the term video gaming covers a whole lot of stuff, including esports. So, panelists, can you disentangle this for me and us and tell us the difference between video gaming and esports and just how big a deal video gaming is? Sure, so I'll start with the numbers uh, and then maybe kick it off to, to you two. So um, just for fun, uh, and now it's a loaded question because we're standing up here on stage, but <laughs> who thinks that uh, the movie industry is larger than the video game industry globally? All right, what about the music industry? All right, what about books? All right. So uh, the video game industry is a loaded actually, question. Yeah, it's a loaded question. The video game industry uh, this year was about $117 billion globally. Uh, by comparison, movies was 45 and music was about 15. Um, so if you combine music and movies together and times it by two, you're almost at what the video game industry is globally. Uh, you combine that with VR, virtual reality, which was around seven and a half billion, you're at 125 billion. Those two things together are predicted to be a quarter of a trillion dollars by 2021. So it is a giant industry that has been uh, growing significantly um, compared to a lot of the other sort of entertainment sectors. And just for fun, books is still winning, surprisingly enough. So print is not dead. Uh, you want to talk about esports? Um, yeah. Uh, so I've been in the esports industry um, since I was probably like in the seventh grade. Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, I beat the number 25 player in uh, Madden in the world. And then a year later, I was number two in NCAA football. Um, right online, but really it was just called video game competitions, like eSports wasn't really a name. And then um, League of Legends came around and kind of started filling the Staples Center, Madison Square Garden, a bunch of other high, um, high attendant venues, and then people are like, okay, well this is just like a sport, let's call it eSport. Um, and then uh, just everyone started getting into it, teams started forming, a lot of money, there's recently been million dollar contracts attached to eSport players. Um, I really wish that was around when I was younger, so. <laughs> <laughs> so and for me personally, yeah, I've been playing since I was about 12. Um, okay, that's a joke, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Just yesterday, right? Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Actually, um, I became involved with eSports uh, back in 2011 when one of my freshman students came up to me after class and said, Dr. Deb, are you interested in starting with me a student organization centered around playing video games? And I think my jaw probably dropped and looked at him like, what? Um, 
And so we talked more about it, and um, we finally came to an agreement that, all right, I, I will invest time in this organization because there's obviously a lot of students interested in this. Um, I will invest my time if you agree that when you have a big competition where there's money involved, you have entrance fees and money goes out to the winners, half of the proceeds go to charity. So I've been involved with that since 2011, and here we are. So uh, some of us of a certain age, when we think of video gaming, uh, we tend to think of things like Space Invaders and Pong. And so it comes as a shock that is, is this not a huge mainstream sport then, uh, akin almost to college football? Actually, more people watch um, the video games, like people playing in competitions, than they watch college football. I don't know if everyone knew that. Um, it's actually second behind um, soccer and viewership. Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, you mentioned League of Legends, the League of Legends World Tournament. If you're just looking at US-based viewers, the League of Legends World Championships uh, had more viewers than everything except for the Super Bowl and the NBA Finals. And if you do world viewership, those two aren't even close. So it's already dwarfing most regular baseball, hockey, uh, US soccer, like you said, global soccer is still a phenomenon, but. You were showing us a, a picture uh, before the presentation of your uh, a, a place, yeah. and it looked like a bunch of people sitting at desks with PCs. What then does a, an eSport competition look like? What are people actually watching? Um, so normally it's just like, uh, think about you're watching a sport, uh, you have all your players, you're watching the, the big screen, so everyone's in one game, you're watching that. There's normally a spectator mode attached to all these games, and you're just watching like a broadcast. So like at Game Arena, uh, we try to provide um, as much professional um, production behind just local tournaments. Um, so just like you're watching a sporting event, we do overlays and transition to sponsors, and we have shoutcasters announcing, so you have people commentating on the actual players, and then we draw an audience to, to watch it in person as well as online. So then are they watching mainly what's going on in the game itself? Yeah. I see. So you can see, like, the, it, the players will also... also often have like face cams and things so you get to see like their expressions their sort of trials and tribulations that they're going through um, how they coordinate with a team if it's a team-based um, eSport which almost all of them uh, all the big ones are so it's fun so is this all just fun and games apparently not Deb because uh, <laughs> we're officially going to roll out a, a major at Ohio State when is that going to begin, and uh, tell us That's how right. this, this came to be a, you convinced or were convinced to start this? Right, so actually this has been in the works for over two years. Um, and believe it or not, it started with um, the advancement group in the Department of Athletics. So they became aware that as, as you've heard, the, the numbers and the interest and, and how viewership and, and people playing and so on, you know, are rising. And so they started looking more into this and looking around resources on campus and started bringing together all the different groups that were actually working with esports and found out there were many. And so this has now led to this large effort on campus, and it's not just the undergraduate major right now, <clears throat> which is a, a collaboration between five different colleges, which is unprecedented. So it's the um, College of Education and Human Ecology, College of Engineering, um, College of Business, the um, Arts and Sciences, and the College of Medicine. So all of those colleges have faculty who are invested in some way in research or teaching courses and game development, game design, um, that it makes sense to bring them all together. And um, in addition to the major, 
We actually right now there is an undergraduate um, minor in game design that is approved and active on campus. Um, but there's also going to be the student life piece. So the student orgs will still continue. We will be creating competitive teams, but decisions have not been made yet as to which games will be the competitive games for our, what would be akin to a varsity athlete. But this will not be under athletics, it will be under student life. Um, in addition, Student Life is sponsoring what they're calling our um, arena, which is uh, half of a floor of, of Lincoln Tower. I don't know if you know how large Lincoln Tower, I think it's over 4,000 square feet of space. They're gonna have 80 plus seats, kind of similar to what Justin has um, at his place. We'll have that available for students to come use, um, free of charge through Student Life. And in addition, there's a research piece to this. So it's a very comprehensive effort at Ohio State that's kind of encompassing all aspects. And I have to tell you, first off, we are not teaching students how to play video games, okay? <laughs> Let's just dispel that. Uh, you mean that. there won't be a gamer Buckeyes? <laughs> no, we are not teaching them that. The student orgs and uh, you know the teams, sure but that's not what we're doing. We're gonna be doing everything surrounding that, right? And so when you think about all the things that go on when Justin puts on a, a, an event, you've got the shoutcasters, you've got the streaming, the online streaming, you've got advertisers with the microtransactions going on, you've got so many things happening. Those are some of the things, you've got managers for the teams, you've got to think about the, the health aspects of the players and so on. Um, in addition, of course, there's gonna be more game design, more you know, creation of games, um, but also thinking about rehabilitation and um, medical aspects, research aspects of games. Um, and then the educational aspect of games. I don't know if any of you have noticed your kids or grandkids playing games to learn, right? There's a lot of games that are used for that. In fact, in one of my classes right now, um, I am using a VR app, a virtual reality. We're doing a study to determine whether or not this um, VR capability can increase students' spatial visualization skills um, because the spatial visualization skills are really important for students for their learning in engineering and lots of other areas for math, for physics, for chemistry, and so on. So, so uh, can I jump in real fast? Go ahead, just because I think you touched on an important thing that made me excited when uh, I and, and my team were asked to help with the uh, sort of the coordination of um, this program and some of the early stages. And I think that's one of the things that people don't tend to realize. They think about games in a very specific way, and they don't realize the halo effect that it has. So you alluded to some of them, but you have game design, you have art, you've got development, you have cybersecurity and e-commerce. Games are at the forefront of all of those, because you're looking at, uh, particularly now with online games, I mean, these are cloud systems that have tens of millions of concurrent users happening from all over the world. Um, so you need like top-notch bank level security, um, microtransactions and in-app purchases, like those all started from the gaming industry, now they're kind of commonplace. Um, then you also have branding and marketing, you have human resources, you have community relations, and you have social media. I don't know if uh, many of you remember the early days of YouTube, that front page that you saw was all the popular stuff that was happening, all the trending things that were happening at the time, and it was always video game based. And so eventually YouTube was like, all right, we need to work how this algorithm works because everybody's just seeing a front page of video game related stuff. So they started tailoring it more to what you wanted to. Um, but it's had such an impact on all of these sectors, um, which I, I think is why a, a multidisciplinary um, program is it's going to be very fruitful. So you mentioned, uh, just as a little uh, sidebar here, about uh, health aspects. Mm -hmm. There were questions a few years back about how it might affect brain development, how just uh, things like diminishing socialization because of the isolation factor and also just the plain old sedentary thing where you're sitting there doing nothing. Tell us about how this <laughs> has developed now. So I'm sure Justin can speak to this. They are not sitting there doing nothing. 
the number of decisions that they have to make per second is phenomenal. And um, in addition to that, so health-wise, there have been lots of studies done, and many of them mm, recently, 2016, where they show that um, actually students, people who play video games have increased cognitive ability, so they think faster, increased spatial visualization, increased perception, increased decision making, and increased social skills. So most of the time, um, like Chris said, the, the games are multiplayer. So you've got to be able to be a team player, right? You've got to communicate. This is not, these are really not kids that are in their, you know, the old misnomer, in the parents' basement playing games by themselves. They want to be social. That's why, you know, there are places that they can go to, and that's why we're building the arena on campus for students to get together and be social. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a misnomer that, that it's a bad thing. One of the stories I always like to tell just about myself, this might make sense to some people, it might not, but uh, back in my younger days, uh, I used to be a raid leader in World of Warcraft. And uh, I played a lot of World of Warcraft, probably too much, but when you think about all of these sessions and books and trainings about how do you be a leader and how do you get people to you know, work together, just looking on paper, a raid in World of Warcraft is 40 people that's led by generally one person and then you usually have a couple people under you that can help make moves because there's a lot going on. Those 40 people are in different time zones, they're in different parts of the world, they are speaking different languages, um, so I'm a 23, 24 year old kid who's organizing a 40 person team to do something that takes two hours of straight focus and communication across the world. Like that's a pretty different place to be in. I don't know many 23, 24 year olds in the business world that have that large of a team that have a direct goal set that will also know when they failed right away. Um, and that's one of the nice things about games. Your, your learning process is a lot faster because you have your goals and then when you fail, you fail and you can restart right away. Um, you don't need a three month window to do your development and then take it out to market to test. You're, you're gonna know if you screwed up pretty quickly. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things and now with esports being um, almost a more professional endeavor, um, I mean these people treat it seriously and they, they are hyper focused on um, trying to be the best in the world. Um, just to piggyback off of the uh, wow comment, um, there's a top 500 CEO that um, a few years ago said, I'll take a, a raid leader um, and wow over anyone as far as hiring. Um, and they're just natural born leaders um, and it's, there's so much coordination. You can, you can tell a lot about someone in a two hour raid than you, you could in an interview. Um, one of the other things I like to mention too is uh, it's a lot easier to control your team when you're paying them. It's a lot harder when these yeah. people are doing it for free that's, that's and exactly you have to keep them too. motivated and focused. Um, but as far as the isolation part, I mean I've had friends in um, France, uh, Suriname. I could tell you a lot about Suriname and I, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you where it is on the, on the globe. <laughs> um, but I, I've had friends in Australia um, and I've played with people all over the United States and I build real relationships with these people. So yeah, I might be like in my house sometimes not socializing with anyone in person, but I mean, I, I have more intimate conversations with people I meet online and talk to every single night for, for months and sometimes years. Um, so there's still that social aspect is there. Um, one thing about Game Arena is that it, it, with hanging out with people in a local setting is still important. So now friends in high school or college, they don't have anything to do on a Friday night. They're all gamers. Instead of sitting at home, all talking to each other over a Discord, they can come to a place and be next to each other because there's still that important aspect of this. And I would also say too, looping back to the health thing, the, the more external facing healthcare applications is at multivarious on our client services side, about 70% of our work this year is in healthcare. So we've worked with Nationwide Children's Hospital, we've worked with OSU, Battelle, uh, University of Calgary's Medical Center. Um, we are using these sort of forefront technologies, a lot of technologies that people have no experience with, like virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, we did a project earlier this year, a VR app for upper extremity injury for clinicians. And um, we sort of have a skill set that a lot of other folks don't use or don't have. And we're also like willing to do weird stuff to try things out. So my background is healthcare. 
Um, I like working with these, these companies and figuring out solutions to problems that are, um, I don't want to say a little more unique or uh, strange. More illustration, please, with strange. Strange? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess we call ourselves a full service, all platform developer. And the reason I say that is because I think when it comes to technology and particularly people who want to be innovative, they have this tendency to like look at the technology first and then try to figure out how to solve their problem. Um, we like to chat with people and be like, what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the experience you want your users to have? So an example of this that we regularly get is people want to use virtual reality and they want to take it to conventions and demonstrations and things like that. And one of the things that I just initially talked to them about is like, do you have any computer experience? Do you, have you ever set up a virtual reality system before? And a lot of times the answer is no. Like, why would some innovation studio in, I don't know, Cardinal or whatever, have used VR that much? Um, and the reason I ask that is because it is a pain in the ass to set up when you go to a convention and you're trying to put all these pieces in, as is demonstrated back there. <laughs> So one of the solutions that we can uh, come up with is we have uh, some mobile headsets. If you come over to our area uh, after this, we can showcase. It's simple. It's like $20, $30 headset. works really, really well. And they're really cool. Yeah, they're awesome. And, and that doesn't require any large setup for things. Um, the uh, upper extremity injury app I talked about, uh, what we did to do that is we took in the VR space, uh, we put you in an artist studio and you are painting these swirls that kind of come up and you have to paint them with your arms and you have colors on the side. Um, so there's like three different colors on one side, three colors on the other. Those swirls are all mimicking clinical grade movements that you would use in a PT clinic. So even though it seems like you're just sort of painting nonsense, we're doing all of the movements that you would be doing with a clinician watching you. And we can capture that movement and record it on the database for your log second by second which is something that cannot happen with traditional therapy. So I don't know how many people have had PT in here. Usually their clinician kind of gets you set up. They're like, do this for five minutes, I'll come back to you. And you just kind of do it for five minutes. And then they ask you how you did. And you're like, ah, I think I did okay, or I did well. Like we can tell from week to week or from minute to minute, because um, we're tracking all of that data. So if you come in next week and you've got a bad, you know, just your arm's really sore and you're having a bad week, we'll know and we'll be able to compare then on the back end, we can actually adjust the exercises to match your current state. So if you are struggling that week, we can tone everything down a little bit. So maybe you don't have these giant sweeping motions. You know, it's just a little bit like that. And we can do these like tailored um, therapy sessions uh, that you just can't do in, in traditional methods. And all from gaming. I mean, and it's all gaming technology. Yeah. VR is all gaming based. Um, a lot of augmented reality is gaming based. One of the stats I like to say, um, and this, this is uh, somewhat older, I think this is like 2012 or 2013, um, but there's this game engine called Unity, and that's what we build a lot of our products in. 60% of apps on the iOS app store had touched Unity at some point. And I'm not talking gaming apps, I'm talking all apps had been through or had Unity involved with that at some point. So that's a game engine, something specifically made for video games, being used in business and healthcare and research and visualizations and big data whatever buzzwords you want to throw out there. Deb, business schools have talked a lot in the last few decades about uh, uh, educating, creating, not just managers, but leaders. So from what Justin and Chris were talking about, this creating of leaders through the games, was this something that was known when, uh, when, when the major it was being talked about, or is this something that's going to be you'll focus on? Yes, it's it's something that was known. Mm -hmm. We before, like I said, before we started development of our curriculum, we went out and spoke to various industry experts. Chris being one of them. Um, a number of companies sat around a table, talked about what kind of skills do we want our our students when they finish to have and we talked to our students also and talked about what kind of things they're interested in we looked at the research so yes we did recognize that playing wow world of warcraft you develop leadership skills and and other games develop other skills and so on um, I mean, what what i didn't know was that 
when you're playing these games, they actually have named positions for what role they play. And boy, are they weird names. <laughs> oh my gosh. You, I'm sure you can, can it you like share. It is a whole language. Yeah. It, yeah. it yeah. is, yeah. it yeah. is. It's talking a whole different language. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Did you consistently keep one name, Justin? Or, um, or one position. One position, one yeah. Position. Like in League of Legends, I play mid lane. Um, that just means I control the middle of the map. Um, but every, it's just like basketball. Each, you know, if you never heard power forward, you, you don't have any idea what that means. Um, it's, it's very similar. Uh, every role has its own position, the set objectives within the main objective of the game. I think that is one of the challenging things with esports is um, you are jumping into a whole other realm. And like I am a gamer, I make games for a living. Um, I don't know what the hell they're talking about in League of Legends most of the time. Um, <laughs> And uh, but it, but it, it's it's exciting. We uh, my team and I we went to this this conference in Boston. It was two or three years ago. We were walking by. I'm like, is that the OSU logo? What the hell is that? And we walked over, and the Big Ten Network was doing an OSU versus Michigan, very timely uh, League of Legends tournament, best of five. And they just had that broadcasting on the Big Ten Network, and they did a big stage um, there. So it was kind of cool to to see that. But I didn't really know what was going on, other than. OSU won, so. And for the record, I was going to say, yes, thank you. For the record, Ohio State won. We did one. Yeah, we won. <laughs> Just like yeah, football. Yeah. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, I, from a, um, a business leader, if you want to call me that, um, but when I think about hiring, um, a lot of, and I talk to a lot of the professors and stuff, like, yes, you need the skill. So if I'm going to hire a developer or an artist or whatever, I, I need them to have some base level of skill, but I would much rather hire somebody that is passionate, that works hard and has critical thinking skills, then you know, we can always sort of teach you how to get better at a specific programming language or whatever. Um, but th that, that critical thinking and that passion is, is super, super important. And the earlier that students can get access to that and start being in that realm and realizing like, particularly in gaming, we are literally at the cutting edge all the time. You have to constantly be learning. It's not an A to B to C business. Like if you want a nine, and I tell my team all this, if you want a nine to five job, like multivarious is not the place for you. Um, it's just, we have a lot going on um, constantly and it, it's very challenging to just stay updated on all that technology. I mean, I can't, every time Apple releases a new iOS update, like three things break and we're like, oh God, we gotta go back and fix everything. It's just, it's just how it is. So the passion and the early uh, learning, there's a very nice anecdote that you told me some months ago about uh, a young fellow who, oh, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, we throw an expo called GDEX. Uh, we throw it every year. Um, this is year seven. Um, and it started out as this, this community endeavor. Uh, people in our community group, um, which was around 250 at the time, it's now almost 1,600. Uh, they wanted to showcase what Columbus developers were working on, right? And so we're like, all right, screw it. Let, let, we keep talking about this thing, let's do it. We did it at OCO our first year. Um, it was just gonna be in a couple of rooms. I think we had 12 exhibitors, no speakers. It wasn't gonna be a big thing. And I'm like, well, if we can get 100 people to come to this thing besides us, I'll consider that a success. And um, about two weeks before the event, we just got blown up. People wanted to speak and sponsor and, and, and showcase. So we pushed it back to December. Uh, first week in December, biggest blizzard of the season, loading crap in at six in the morning and the ice and the sleet and the snow. A couple weeks before that, I'd gotten this email from this, this guy. I didn't, I remember his name, his name's Devin. I didn't know anything about him. Um, and he wanted to showcase what he'd been working on. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm just working on this thing on my own. I would love to be able to get feedback. And I'm like, well, we're, we're sort of filled up right now. We went from our 12 exhibitors to 33. We didn't have any space. Uh, he's like, well, if I, if I come, you know, is there a chance that I might be able to showcase? I'm like, look, I'll tell you what, if, if you show up um, and I can find a space for you, I'll, I'll do what I can, but no guarantees. Um, so that day, the blizzard, I'm running around like a crazy person trying to run the show, and my fiance uh, hits me up, and she's like, hey, there's this kid that you should talk to. I'm like, okay. And I go over to him, I'm like, oh, okay, Devin, it's nice to meet you. I didn't realize he was a high school student when he e emailed me. And I just assumed when he said he wanted to like showcase something, he was gonna like bring his laptop and maybe we could like sit him down on a table or whatever. This kid packed up his desktop computer, his monitor, his keyboard and his mouse into his backpack, took the bus from the south side up to the Union on the off chance he was gonna get to show something. In a snowstorm. In a snowstorm. On the off chance he was gonna get to show something. So I, I went and I talked to, to my fiance Tina. I was like, I don't give a where this is. 
find this kid a place. And thankfully, because of the blizzard, uh, one of our people couldn't make it, so uh, they found him a, a thing. But like those, that's the kind of passion and dedication a high school student came and, and did this. Um, and then one of the other GDEX stories I like to tell is uh, we are in a very um, interesting community and audience, and a lot of us are naturally introverted. Um, you know, going out and being a part of something large is sort of a scary experience. Um, but one of our volunteers who's been in our community forever, uh, it was the second GDEX, I believe, he came up to, again, Tina and I, and he's like, I just want to let you know that for the first time in my life, uh, I haven't felt awkward or out of place um, because he was a part of this thing. And so I think there's a lot more than just thinking about the business aspects and the educational aspects. Like this is, for people, this is a personal endeavor. These are, these are works of passion. Um, and these people want to stay in Columbus. They do not want to leave Ohio. And I think we have a, uh, a great opportunity to, to build something really special here. So do we know where Devin is right now? I do not, actually. I lost contact with him. Uh, that's too bad. Yeah. Um, we're going to be moving to audience questions in a few minutes, uh, at which point uh, I would encourage you to go up to the microphone over there and don't be shy about it. Uh, I'm going to get a little final thought here and ask our panelists, um, uh, how soon are we going to be expected to enter the matrix? <laughs> Probably sooner than we know. I don't know. <laughs> AI is moving pretty quick, so. Deb, any, any thought well, on that? Well, when this major rolls out, I think we have a greater chance of it happening yeah. sooner. Maybe OSU student will make the matrix? That's right. I, I tell you, since, since the announcement's been made about this happening at the university, my email has blown up with current OSU students, high school students, parents of students saying, my student plays blah, blah, blah. How do I get him into this? You know, um, there's so much interest. So uh, like Chris said, the students are really passionate about what they're doing. So yeah, it might be sooner than you think. Um, one thing I wish I to get across whenever I talk is um, just why uh, esports are as gonna be as big as they are gonna be and why they're so big is um, I like to compare it to like LeBron James, right? He's six eight, has a 40 some vertical. How many people are born with that physical stature? Probably not a thousand in the world. But um, anyone can play a video game. Like the Hilliard Darby League of Legends team has a five foot girl, um, has someone that's six foot six, someone that's three, over 300 pounds, and they all play at a top 5% level. So it really, you're talking about everyone in the world is not that has no barriers when they're entering uh, competition for this. So just imagine how many people are drawn to it. You have no um, diminishing returns. You can't play basketball for more than two hours a day. You can easily play 16 hours a day. I, I'm telling you, I've done it. <laughs> and you have. I have, yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't get bored of it. Um, you, can, you really like practice. Um, the League of Legends team, um, TSM, actually got scurvy once. Uh, this was in the unhealthy days of League of Legends. Now it's completely fine. But they did get scurvy from not going outside. They practiced too much, um, didn't go outside enough. Um, but now they, they've realized that mental health is an important part of b building a team. So now there's workout facilities in these team houses. They, they eat healthy. They have cooks 24-7, making sure they get the nutrients, the correct sleep. Um, so it, it's really going to be huge. They wear their team jerseys like you are today. Oh, always. Yes. Oh, they they have full merchandise. They got everything, chairs, everything. So, Justin, how how, how do you view the uh, uh, coming OSU dedicated esports arena? Is that going to be a little competition for your uh, business? I hope not. I hope uh, we're going to be working with them to create some really cool competitions. That's the best part. Is uh, like you can only have so many PCs in one facility and you can hold, it's online, so you can have multiple facilities constantly uh, housing. And I mean, Columbus has a lot of people that love gaming, so uh, I don't look at this competition at all. Agreed, yes, we'll be working together, <laughs> yep. So it, it won't be uh, siphoning off uh, fans uh, or no. players. No, there's plenty. Very of good. I don't think so. And, and we will not have our students be playing 16 hours a day. Um, <laughs> during the day, class hours, the facility will be used for classwork, not for students to be playing. <laughs> and the first students will probably start next fall? That's what we're hoping for. 
All right. That's, that's a tough, that's a tough haul for us that's all. That's a tough call. Bringing together that new program is going to be difficult. So, it is the CMC's tradition to take audience questions, and I would ask you to state your name and ask your question. And since I am not Alex Trebek and this is not Jeopardy, please state your question in the form of a question and not an answer. In other words, we don't want too much editorial comment. It, it's supposed to be a question time. So, let's get started. Care assistance. Um, we bowling, is there a we bowling league? <laughs> That's not my question. <laughs> You alluded to it, Justin, when you mentioned a female, so I wanted to ask about gender in, in gaming. Is, are women and females of all ages playing, and if so, do they play differently? Um, no, they don't play differently. Um, they're a lot more, um, I was surprised to see how many girls actually come out and play, um, and they can play at a high level. There, there really is no barrier. Um, sure, guys tend to have a culture built around playing video games nonstop with their other guy friends, and I would say that's the biggest advantage that a guy would have to a girl, is girls aren't at nine out of 10 under 18 play video games yet. It's like at six out of 10 play, but um, I'm sure it'll be there soon. I'm glad you brought up that, that point, because that's a really important point. Um, and it's not just women. Um, it's also underserved populations because to get into playing a lot of these games, you need a lot of money. So, and that's another reason why Student Life has stepped up and created this, um, the arena on campus so that any student can come and have access to the same resources and games and play. Um, in fact, I'm involved right now with a, a faculty, Dr. Simone Drake at Ohio State. Um, we've submitted a grant, a, a Betha grant, I pray we, we get funded because what we want to do is put on uh, for two years a four-week summer camp for underserved students um, to expose them to, to the esports industries, all the resources that are there, and to teach them to code. So um, we, we need to get these students more involved. And women sometimes um, on campus at Ohio State, I know they play. I see them come, they'll come up to me or they'll email me and say that they play. But they don't like to come out under some of the high intense competitions, right? They're happy to play in their dorm room or you know have a, have a small competition in the dorm, but they don't like to come out in the big events. So um, that's a big part of the development of the major is changing that culture. Um, that is one of our, our top goals is diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, so it's a really important point, thanks. Uh, so looking at the industry just overall, um, it's about 60, 40, just players, gamers, is about 60, 40 men and women. Um, and that's all types of gaming, mobile, PC, everything. But if you look at the industry itself, um, it's about 20% women, so there's still a lot of room to go. Um, but one of the sort of reassuring things is that um, the indie scene, which is the smaller studios, the, the, um, you've got your bigger ones like Activision and whatnot, but smaller ones, um, you're starting to see a lot of female-led studios that are, are small, that are starting up. Um, that are doing games that are telling their stories. Um, and also because gaming is a global endeavor, you're starting to see a lot of really awesome um, products come out from all over the world. Um, there's this, this hackathon that happens annually called Global Game Jam. Uh, I found out talking to their executive director, the largest on-site uh, space in the world is in Cairo, Egypt. Um, so you're starting to see a lot of like really cool stuff. Uh, we had this, this group come from Cuba um, at this, uh, the video game art gallery in Chicago, and they had this, this special showcase. And they were talking to me, they're like, we don't have internet. So what they do is they pack up their computer every day and they go to the public square and they work outside because Cuba has free public Wi-Fi access in public parks. And so they, they tear everything down, they go, they set up, they work all day as long as it's not raining, tear everything back down, take it home, they can't really work without the internet, and that's, that's what they do. So we're starting to see a lot of, of interesting stories um, coming out of, of different parts of the world. That's dedication. It is dedication. People love it. Um, I'm Jane Scott, and I drove here today in my horse and buggy, so have some patience with me. Um, so I have about three questions, if, if you can indulge me. Um, Will there be something on campus for all of us old folks to have like a 101 
um, so that we can catch up with all of this so that as we go into retirement, retirement homes can have teams of gamers. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I could see this as a great um, fix or a great prevention of Alzheimer's. I mean, seriously. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, it was kind of joking there, but we're actually working right now as one of our client projects, which is uh, for retirement communities for people with Parkinson's and balance therapy. Uh, we're, we're developing yeah. that right now. We're looking at um, how do you make it engaging, how do you use tablets um, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot, how, how do you use VR maybe? So, and, and not just from the the medical aspect, the research side. Um, also, we plan, once we get the major in place, um, to work on some certificate programs so that if you're interested in learning about the industry, mm -hmm. you could look at you know, getting a certificate, perhaps. Cool, and my next question, um, ran into a cab driver in France about a month ago that spoke excellent English, and we asked him where he learned his English. He says, I game worldwide. Yep. Well, there you go. So, so the question in that is, in 50 years, what's the impact on world peace? <laughs> I don't know, maybe we can settle our wars through uh, some League of Legends tournaments or something, I don't know. <laughs> Pokemon <laughs> battles. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is John McKnight. Um, you know, fast forward 20 years or 50 years or, or whatever period of time you want is, are, are we going to see um, gaming replace conventional sports? Um, you know, it's already topping numbers as far as viewership from what you're saying um, for most conventional athletic sports. Um, and the generation that's powering video gaming um, is still, you know, the younger half of the world. So as they mature, as they grow up, are we going to see, you know, football, baseball, basketball, soccer take a back seat to it? I want to jump in just real fast. To tap. So just for fun, who thinks the average age of a gamer is under 20? 20 years old. Oh, come on. <laughs> you have to have an opinion. Who thinks it's under 30? Okay. So the average age of a gamer is actually 37. Uh, I happen to be 37, just for fun, and uh, the average age of a video game purchaser is in their early 40s, and a lot of that has to do with purchasing for children, um, but it's a misnomer that the average age of a gamer is 16, 18 years old. It's just, it's just not the case anymore. I do think it's going to be much more mainstream than what it is right now. I think you're, you're going to see a lot more advertisements, a lot more stuff on television about it. It's not just going to be on the internet. I think it's going to be a lot more in the open. In, in the future, um, but I can't see regular, the athletics going away. I think what we're seeing now is that, at, I think what, what was um, alluded to previously, that the students who have different interests, whose body types don't fit the athletic type, they're not interested in this, this standard athletics, are, are now finding a home and a place where they feel they're accepted and they love it and enjoy it. Yeah, I would just piggyback on that. Yeah, it's because of all the reasons I said before, it's just going to be another avenue for all these people. But traditional sports are still a lot of fun, a lot of fun to watch. I don't think they're going away. Kids still like sports and they, they play video games every day and they still like to follow Ohio State and uh, the Bengals and all that. So. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to go away, but yeah, maybe more people's interest is now I'm going to be an eSport athlete growing up instead of a, a football athlete or something like that. So, I don't know if, if you are aware, but a lot of the traditional athletes, the big named athletes, are now owners of eSport teams. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I look at that question slightly differently because I think just by... We, we as humans like to put things in the buckets, right? We like to create categories, but like, just because you're a gamer doesn't mean you don't like sports, or it doesn't mean you don't like running, or it doesn't mean you don't like whatever. Um, gaming is becoming so ubiquitous in society that it's just another part of things you enjoy. So you can be a professional athlete and still enjoy gaming. And, and like you said, there's a lot of professional athletes that are both um, Esports owners that are parts of games, you know, they're, they're navigating their contracts for things like um, Madden and whatnot to, to have their likenesses in there. Um, it's just going to become another another part of life, you know. And it's not like one of those things. Well, you like movies. Does that mean you don't like music? Well, no, of course not, right? 
Um, so I, I think it's going to just become part of who we are as, as a culture. It, it already is there. Hi, my name is Mike Yearling, and I'm sure there's uh, many of us in the audience, like myself, who are wondering how to participate in this growth industry, whether it's through business, you know, business interests, personal interests. My question is, where do you guys see the gaps or the unmet needs or the services or the technologies that are either hindering growth or could help accelerate growth for the kind of business-minded in all of us? So that is a great question. Um, we are knee deep in the middle right now of having conversations about how to get funding into, into these projects. So uh, I'm talking about either creating a fund or investment opportunities. Because um, the reality is there just is not a lot of money that comes into this industry. And any, any of the creative tech stuff, VR, AR, um, drones, interactive arts, immersive technology, they're just not getting a ton of funding. Um, and one of the things that I say in, in my interactions with a lot of the VC companies in the city and the state is I don't think it's a money issue in Ohio. We have money here. I, I think it's a cultural issue where people just aren't sure, to your point, mm -hmm. how do I even begin? Or, you know, I don't understand necessarily what the implications and the impact of this industry are. And uh, that's something that at Multivarious, our team's been working really, really hard to sort of, you know, attend things like this and, and talk about what these opportunities are. Because um, to be blunt, there really is not anything like what's going on in Columbus and Ohio. It's not happening in Chicago. It's not happening in Indy or Philly. Like, we are doing something really, really amazing here. Um, but we need both business support and we need financial support to really blow it out of the water. So we, uh, does the film tax credits tie in to... Uh... So the film tax credit is very interesting, and that's another conversation I'm, I'm having. So video games do qualify for the film tax credit. The problem with it is that it requires, it's a $300,000 annual floor for a project. Most startup companies aren't spending $300,000 in development costs per year, so you don't qualify for it. So that, that's one of it. Um, the other thing is that uh, tax credits are great, but tax credits only help you if you're making money, right? You can offset your tax liabilities. Um, most startup companies three to five years before they really make any money, and that's where you need the investment. You need to create a runway of 12, 18, 24 months to be able to create any kind of software product, um, and that, that's where some of these challenges are coming from. And uh, thankfully, we're having really, really good conversations around these areas, um, and I, I welcome you all you know, afterwards if, if you want to connect. I, I would love to, to chat and find opportunities where businesses can be involved. We throw our big expo. Uh, last year, we had uh, 2,700 turnstile attendees from 28 states and two countries come. So this is a draw from across the country, um, and we've got all sorts of, you know, we have healthcare stuff, we have games, we've got all these immersive technologies. It's not just a video game show. So I think there's a lot of uh, avenues where people can be involved in what we're doing and, and what uh, we're doing here. Yeah, and I can say from Ohio State's point of view, uh, we also could, we are looking for sponsors for our teams, for the facility, and so on. Um, but also, anyone who has openings for interns, right, will, I'm hoping that we will have an internship involved in our undergraduate major, and um, We'll be looking for spots. We've already met with our career services folks, and we're looking for um, companies who are open to working with our students. So please let us know. Um, two more questions, and we'll wrap it up. Steve Ferguson from Nationwide. So when I started playing video games, Justin, it was you know, standalone PC games, and then it was console gaming, and then it was console gaming online. And now it seems to be moved to mobile gaming. It's a, it's a I think, a multi-million dollar industry. So first question for everybody, but specifically you, Justin, is PC gaming dead? Is console gaming dead or on the way out? And then the second thing is three to five years, what's the next big thing? Is it what's beyond mobile gaming? I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, so first off, PC Master Race. Um, it's, PC gaming is so superior just based on the technology, the amount of players, mouse and keyboard will not be um, by, replaced by thumbs ever. Um, just the rea reaction time, you can get super quick, almost instantaneous um, clicks compared to like a controller that has input lag on everything you do. Um, so PCs will always um, 
on just be for the foreseeable future unless something completely new. Now, mobile gaming is definitely hitting um, like a lot more people that just have downtime or um, if they have a full PC available to play or a mobile, um, they're probably picking the PC version um, to play, and that's where all the competitive players are. Um, there are a few games that are doing pretty well in the, in the mobile space as far as eSports, but I wouldn't put them on a top ten list of any sport, uh, eSport out there. And again, just because I'm a numbers guy, I like numbers. Um, th th a lot of people were asking that question. You know, mobile's getting so big. You've got you know half a billion units out there. Um, the PlayStation Four and the Xbox One are they just hit their fifth birthday like two days ago or whatever? Um, they're already over. Uh, PlayStation Four is already over 90 million units, which is uh, the entire life cycle of the PlayStation Three was about 85, and that was over eight or nine years. Um, and it's outselling the PlayStation 3 dramatically. It's totally destroying the sales numbers of the Xbox One, but even the Xbox One is outselling the previous console, the 360, mm -hmm. by significant margins. So both PC and console sales are doing better than they ever have before, and I don't see that um, stopping anytime soon. And what's really interesting about um, console sales and games as well is that it's uh, recession resistant. It's not recession proof. Um, but a lot of people, when the recession hit, were expecting the industry to take a, a nosedive, uh, and it actually didn't. It still showed better growth margins or b growth rates than a lot of other industries because people were just pulling back. They weren't going out to eat. They weren't traveling. They weren't doing these other activities, but they would stay home because you can spend $60 and get 200, 300 hours of entertainment out of a product. And the final question. Hi, I'm Amanda Sage. Uh, I don't want to end things on a downer, so I'm going to try and put an upspin on it. Tim kind of touched about the sedentary lifestyle. I know the people in my life, a lot of them that I know, and then also my sister's a teacher, so she sees high school students. The two big things you, you see are people who literally sit on their couch for six hours a day, and then also the people whose lives are being consumed. Even if they're still playing four or five hours a day, you're looking at students who can't get off of their phones in class because they're so obsessed with playing a game. Or you have 45, 55-year-old adult men who's let their lives or their work lives suffer because of this. This is stuff that you see, these are the real world problems. What's being done to combat that? Because that's, from, from my personal experience, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, so everybody looks at me. Okay, uh, so. <laughs> Talk to professor. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of research being done on that. It's a really good question. Um, so, a lot of what they show is that everything in moderation. You know, I have to say, it really is that, that parents need to limit the playtime. And I had to do that with my son. You know, he was really into World of Warcraft and League of Legends and, oh my goodness. So it's like, okay, you can't play till the work is done, right? Um, and, and that's what really has to happen. But a question in classes, um, a lot of times students are not necessarily playing games. They might be on whatever social media stuff is going on. And I think social media is actually more of a problem than playing games at school is for, for the young students. So. Yeah, I, I would end it, uh, try to end it on a high note as well. Um, I, I think there are, definitely, uh, there are definitely concerns about sedentary lifestyle, uh, addiction concerns. Um, there's a lot of uh, gaming loops, compulsion and addiction loops that are used by gambling that are now you're seeing in, in video games. And I think that um, requires us that are within the industry and you all who are consumers to make it very clear what we find acceptable and what we don't because um, particularly in the mobile space, they're just trying to make as much money as they can with these apps. They have a very short lifespan, so they need to make as much as they can. And sometimes that comes at the cost of the user. And so making sure that we're, we're pushing those, those kind of things. Um, actually, the, it was just, I think today, the FTC said that they're going to start looking at loot boxes, which is almost a form of gambling, where you purchase something in a game, and then you might get a random distribution of stuff. Um, so they're looking at that, and is that gambling or not? Um, so I think we all need to look at that, but I think that on the positive note, we have more people right now that are super excited about this industry and where this technology can go, and they are honestly and genuinely um, want to have a positive impact on the industry. They're not out there to just nickel and dime as much as they can. They, they want this, this thing that they love to grow over the next 10, 20, 50 years into something really wonderful. So. 
Um, yeah, about the sedentary lifestyle, um, I de I'm, I'll be the first one to tell you you should always spend an hour at least of physical activity elsewhere at the gym. Um, if you can play six hours of video games, you should play five hours of video games and one hour at the gym at the, at the worst case scenario. Um, but I, I really think as far as the change it is, it has shown, at least at the pro level, um, they've proven that being physically healthy makes you think better. So working out, eating healthy are already starting to go into what it takes to be a pro gamer. So if you're not doing that stuff, you're just at a disadvantage. So most coaches at, at least will do it. But for the guy that's at his house that has nobody telling him what to do, I think that's going to be a problem even with TV or anything else. Nicole? Well, what a great conversation. Thanks to each of you for being here. And thank you as well. OK, so let's thank our speakers. Chris Volpe, Deborah Grzybowski, Justin Kagi, and Tim Farron. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you again soon.